This year, MDI is celebrating its 60th anniversary, 60 years of employing and empowering people with disabilities. Approximately half of MDI's employees are people with disabilities. Part of MDI's purpose is to facilitate conversations about workforce inclusion, and that is exactly why we are here today. We have three outstanding panelists, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Uh, the first one is Eric Black. Eric, why don't you tell us uh, why you are passionate about the topic of inclusive employment? Yeah, you know, it is, um, I think not everybody recognizes with many people being employed, how important a job is to an individual's, uh, to their mental health wellness, to their personal uh, being. And I know we talk a lot about, you know, everybody wanting to work remote, but, you know, there, there's still a contingency that wants to be surrounded by other human beings and having that opportunity. And I've benefited my whole life, uh, you know, started working at 13. So I've, you know, work is all I kind of know in that facet. And to understand that there's individuals in our communities who want to work, who don't have an equal opportunity to work. There's just something about working for an organization whose mission is to provide those jobs, but then to go even further is to help those individuals in our communities that may want to work at other places, be able to find those opportunities. So I come to work each day invigorated about the mission. Um, and I get more energy from it than I actually give to it. So, um, that's what that that's why I enjoy what we do. Well said, Eric, and thanks for being here. Our next panelist is Julie Strumman, who is the training and organizational development manager at Anderson Corporation. Julie, why don't you tell us why you are passionate about this topic of inclusive employment? Good morning, everyone. Thrilled to be here. And I think the the part of this conversation that is really intriguing to me is the work that we're doing as employers. Um, to be advocates and a catalyst for best practice sharing and what we're able to learn just across the entire landscape, across industries of really amazing work that is being done um, on behalf of the employee experience that we can all begin to explore and implement within our own teams. Thank you, Julie. Our final panelist is Meredith Kujala, who is a program coordinator at Advocating Change Together. Welcome, Meredith. Why don't you tell us why you are passionate about the topic of inclusive employment? Uh, thank you. Um, I am passionate about it because I think it's important. And until we are all like every employer is inclusive, I'm not going to stop talking about it. Uh, myself as a person with a disability, I want to be given the same opportunities as everybody else, which to me is common sense. Um, but it seems that, you know, in some, some aspects of society, it's not. Um, so it really drives me to want to help make those changes and advocate. I mean, I'm a firm believer that, you know, if I'm not going to advocate for it, then I need to, you know, be quiet and not talk about it. So that's, that's what drives me. Thank you, Meredith. So I have a series of questions we're going to uh, go through, um, but for all of the people watching, please feel free to submit questions in the chat. We will have time to sift through of those and ask a couple of those at the end if you have any, any questions you'd like to ask. And my first question is for everyone. Let's start with Eric. Um, before we talk about progress, let's first address barriers. Eric, in your opinion, what are the barriers to inclusive employment in today's workplace? Yeah, first I got to give you a shout out having an interpreter on a Zoom call. I'm, how often? I mean, how many times do you actually join a Zoom call where you actually have that? So I didn't know y'all were going to do that, but that's 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 awesome. That that's progress, right? That's our understanding that um, there's these choices we can make, um, how small they may be, um, uh, but they're big for other people. Uh, so. Truly on that. With that, I forgot the question you asked. What'd you ask me, Chris? That that just threw me, that was just so cool. It threw me for a loop. Um, um, ask me the question again. Absolutely. What, in your opinion, are some barriers to inclusive employment in today's workplace? You know, I think there is a lot of practices that are put in place that have tended to make the lives easier for the bulk of the population or the bulk of the decision makers. Um, and I think when those are done to make life easier for some, they make life easier or tougher for others. 
Um, and that continues to grow. Um, I think technology is one of our, you know, best assets, but sometimes that technology begins to interfere with the human side or the differences that uh, really exist. And in the category that we focus on with individuals of all abilities, those differences are very broad. There, there are no two human beings that are exactly alike, even twins, um, you know, favor differences. Um, and so these systematic uh, things uh, like our employment practices or screening practices is one, right? So it begins to ask certain questions that it believes should be correct. Um, you know, ability to work off hours, ability to work weekends, not understanding that there can be some transportation limitations that really occur for people being able to say yes. And you really have people who want to be authentic and truthful who answer, well, I can't always do it. So they'll say they can't, right? But really, it just means they need an accommodation. And, and before we can get to an accommodation discussion, sometimes you have to get further down the line and there's further fears. So I think there are some common practices that we have that are really putting these barriers in place. And as, as employers, we have to evaluate, really, can the people on the fringe ends really participate in the practices we have and then bring that in to probably understand where our gaps are. We may not change some of our practices, but we may understand if we want to be the most diverse organization, we have to have some targeted efforts to create that diversity a pool or candidates that we want because our normal systems in, uh, that we have in place don't do that. So that's, I think on the front end, I think that's one of the things that I've seen hinder in my conversations with individuals, them getting in the door or a chance to express who they are and what they actually bring. Thanks, Eric. Julie, let's go with you next. Keep talking about barriers. What, in your opinion, and what you have observed are some barriers to inclusive employment in today's workplace? For sure, Chris. Some of the things that immediately come to mind would be a lack of education and a lack of a growth mindset or continuous improvement mindset. Again, I'm speaking from like inside the, the employer experience um, and, and really making an addition to my team of adding a person who has run a disability resource center that can be that education conduit for leaders and to walk side by side with them as they begin to widen the vernacular around talent comes in all sorts of packages, right? And, and how can we prepare the employee experience in advance of someone's arrival and then throughout the entire employee life cycle um, to anticipate and partner to solve solutions, provide solutions when there are barriers. One of the things that I'm most grateful for is working in operations where the work is really, really challenging and we have to overcome big and small barriers all day long. And so we have something that we say a lot that's called run to the fire. Um, and because that sometimes is the mindset in Anderson and manufacturing, for us to pivot and change or make a, a, an adjustment for how we do things or to partner upstream or downstream of our training and development team so that we can help leaders to create and anticipate where we might need to change the way we do the work to allow additional people to come into the organization and to find their way and to find their career at Anderson. So those are the things that I have seen that have been transformational in our culture just by walking side by side with leaders to, again, like help them to gain a growing, growth mindset, and then also just to educate our organization around what could really be possible in this space. Thank you, Julie. Finally, Meredith, um, your perspective on what are the barriers to inclusive employment in today's workplace? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I really I want to highlight a couple of things that both um, previous uh, just said that that they took some of the words out of my mouth that I had in my notes. Um, but you know, first starting with you know the whole uh, the employment practices. Um, Eric nailed it where you know those employment practices generally cover a majority of the employer or employees. Um, but what about the non-majority? Um, and those non-majority are typically those folks uh, with disabilities. Um, and that leaves them, you know, with without the tools that they need um, to be successful in their employer. I think a big chunk of um, barriers or what causes um, 
this big barrier is the lack of uh, education and training um, in these work workforce places um, and the mindset of creating an inclusive environment. I know, you know, um, if you're, you know, they always say if you're not affected by it or know somebody that's affected by it, then you don't think about it. Um, and I think that's the problem sometimes um, with employers. They're just not thinking about or thinking outside the box of how to be a more inclusive um, employer, because in their eyes, they already are. Um, and then I think it also comes down another big barrier, the biases and judgments um, from employees sometimes um, that might affect hiring people with disabilities. So, you know, we have people with disabilities out there that, you know, have already jumped that hurdle to apply for the job and have gotten the interview. Um, but then, you know, they get to the interview part and sometimes it's more difficult if you have a physical disability, um, because sometimes there's those biases and judgments, um, from the employer that, you know, it might cost too much or they can't do the employer or somebody else is, um, better fit. Um, and again, you know, I'm not talking about every employer and I'm not talking about, I'm not talking from a standpoint from everybody with a disability. Um, just collectively, this is what I've heard throughout the years. So, thank you, Meredith. All right, we've addressed barriers. Let's get a little more positive here. Eric, next question is for you. Um, let's talk about MDI. MDI has been providing employment and services for people with disabilities for 60 years. I know you haven't been there for all of these 60 years, but you are the current president and CEO. So, what can you say about what MDI has done to be successful in implementing inclusive employment practices? Well, one of the things is it's our mission, right? So I, I, I don't take for granted that we are an organization built to do just that act. Um, so it's leading through the mission. Um, I think um, it may be a little bit easier with nonprofits because we can have humanitarian based uh, missions and really double down on that. Um, that's the practical side, right? Our North Star is in the right direction. Um, we we walk toward it and, and we're able to do it. But then it comes to really assembling the right resources on our team. So having shared value system throughout our organization has been really key where leaders all can kind of know where we're wanting to drive the organization. And then that trickles down to their leaders, the supervisors, the managers. And so everybody's on one accord that this is the way we want our organization to look and reflect. And then we do things to really um, be an amendable or open to accommodations, right? We want individuals to have the opportunity to express and deliver the best of themselves. And sometimes that takes some accommodations. The benefit is when we typically make accommodations, those accommodations are good for everybody. Um, one of it is, you know, we have over a hundred different work schedules at MDI across our five facilities. So you think it's kind of a flexible place to work? Yeah. You know, Kind of benefit from that. Got to drop the kids off in the morning. Yeah, kind of benefit from that. Got to go to a baseball game in the afternoon. Yeah, kind of benefit from that, right? So everybody's kind of benefiting from a culture um, that's really trying to set itself up to be really great for transportation facts, but we don't exclude people from also having the benefits that this um, rich culture brings. I think the other thing was we question ourselves and our practices to make sure that they don't harm others, right? So when we're putting things in place, we're asking the questions, how will everyone benefit from this? And when we see that there might be an adverse impact, we try to remedy that ahead of time um, and ensure that individuals that might have or need a little bit degree of flexibility don't get harmed from our practices. And that's having a body, one person may not catch it, but another person will call it to question. And we're able to build this culture that really, really meets. And the last thing I would say is, really having a, a person-centered um, environment. So we look at people and we understand what their goals and objectives that they have and ultimately believe it's our mission to help them get to where they want to go versus what we need them to do as a company exclusively. And that's led to individuals taking on jobs, roles, opportunities that has allowed their career to go. And that's helped heavily with our ability to retain our employees, have lower turnover, and ultimately, individuals not wanting to leave our organization has been extremely fruitful by trying to make sure we, we're we practicing um, these things as leaders and that they percolate throughout our organization. 
Beautifully said, Eric. Thank you. Julie, you're next. Let's talk about Anderson. Um, how has your company been successful in implementing inclusive employment practices? Well, I want to go back in time a little bit to the COVID pandemic and a period of time starting in, of course, 2020, um, when we saw dramatic increase in the growth of our business, like historic levels of business that we've never seen, and thus required that we grow many of our teams across our assembly plants and logistics centers. One plant that I was working in that year, we onboarded a thousand people in one year. And to be able to do that, we relax you know, our requirements for entry-level jobs, specifically not requiring that people have a GED or high school diploma. And as a result, when you onboard a thousand people, like all sorts of individuals, like all of a sudden have access to good jobs. And that included languages and abilities. And I think what we learned in um, just understanding who, um, who our employees were and the diversity of all people in our plants really caused us to make some very large systemic changes around how we onboard and train and develop and communicate and number one, keep people safe. And so I think about um, in a couple of particular plants where we had a growing deaf workforce um, and that just being something that was really um, we weren't aware in all cases that we had deaf employees in some of our plants and really caused us to very quickly get educated around how we would support individuals that did not have full access to the employee experience. And that was really the beginning of some transformation at Anderson around how best to support individuals. And that all starts by involving communities within our workforce to be part of the solution. And, um, and even that was a change for the way that we approach our work in the people space was to like, you know, some of the things that we've learned from deaf community has been nothing for us without us. And what we were able to prioritize as solutions in, in conjunction with our deaf workforce um, turned out to be solutions for everybody. So when we found out that obviously our public address system in our largest flagship location was only um, activated audibly. So you had to be able to hear to understand like what the communication emergency was. And yet the, the quality of the system and the infrastructure that ran that system was very old and antiquated. And so even our hearing employees couldn't understand like what was being communicated in terms of evacuations or safety alerts. And so that caused a huge investment to be made um, on the part of the Anderson Board of Directors to completely replace that system that now has not only audible alerts, but also visual cues and haptic wearables and, um, and all sorts of um, alert elements that now are good for all of our employees. So again, um, I think what we find is that as soon as you turn on closed captioning, right, that um, that is part of a Zoom call or a Teams call, there are many more people that are understanding the benefits of activating some of those tools to think more broadly around access for all people. Thank you, Julie. Meredith, it's your opportunity to give some advice here. Um, there are some business leaders in the audience today and wondering if you have any advice for business leaders and what they can do to make workplaces more inclusive. Yeah, yeah. Well, both Eric and Julie brought up some great, great points about what their agencies are doing, which is great. Um, and one thing I was going to bring up, um, but Julie kind of brought it up, is sometimes these changes with employers aren't done until somebody's affected in their agency. So bringing up somebody who was deaf and hard of hearing um, with an agent, with the agency, and then the accommodations or changes were made. Um, I think we need to back up as a society or as employers and, you know, just start making um, things inclusive across the board. Um, like Julie also said, you know, the closed captioning doesn't just help somebody um with you know with a disability it helps anybody it helps everybody Any, anybody can benefit from it so i think you know we need to start there is trying 
as an employer to be as inclusive as possible, no matter if we have somebody with a disability or not, um, or has somebody that um, identifies with a disability or not. You know, there's a lot of employers out there that probably have employees um, that have disabilities, but they are not um, acknowledging their disability um, in fear of, uh, I don't know, there's fear of many things. Um, which is kind of sad and frustrating to hear. Um, but another thing I think that, you know, agencies can do is including people with disabilities, you know, as leaders, um, not definitely not saying, you know, hiring somebody with a disability in, you know, a higher up position just because they have a disability. Obviously, they should have the qualifications and, you know, the tools and experience and whatnot that they need. Um to be in that position, but, you know, if at all possible, hire people with disabilities to be in these leadership roles um, or HR professions, um, or at the bare minimum, having them at the table uh, when some of these, you know, decisions or changes are being made. Uh, because again, you know, I go back to my other previous statement, if you're not being affected by it or someone you know isn't being affected by it, chances are you don't, you don't know. Um, and so I think, you know, bringing people that do know or have been affected um, can really, you know, help. Um, and then I think, you know, the last thing I would recommend is just being open minded as excuse me, being open minded as employers um, and just keeping up with best practices, uh, whether that's, you know, attending trainings um, or, uh, you know, education um, or modeling or checking out what other employers are doing, but just really being mindful of that um, on a day-to-day -day and annual basis. So thank you. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, we're going to go around the horn with a question for all three of you, and Meredith will go right back to you. Uh, and by the way, lots of people are weighing in on the chat, agreeing with uh, what you're saying and appreciating what you're saying, Meredith. The next question is, for someone with disabilities, what advice would you give to a person with disabilities who is trying and maybe even struggling to get a job? Yeah, so this is a, a, a tough one, you know, and I, I don't I'm not here to be like a negative Nancy or a Debbie Downer. Um, but, you know, when we when I talk, when I listen to this question or think about this question, you know, we've within the disability community that I have worked with or have interacted with, um, we, we kind of joke and say, well, try to hide your disability as best you can, which is really sad, like, mindset to have. Um, but sometimes people with disabilities feel that they they have a strike against them because of that disability. So when they're going to that interview, they might, and again, might, I'm not saying everybody, but they might already have the anxiety that they are one step behind because of um, something they can't, they can't um, change. Um, the other thing, you know, sometimes people with disabilities uh, experience or feel, they feel that they have to work that much harder at an interview than the average person. So they might feel that they, they have to, you know, show, they have to make an impression beyond their disability mean like a physical disability so if, for example if I give myself um, I have a physical disability it's very apparent when I walk into a room so if I walk into a room I feel like I have to get the attentions of the employers in a positive way so they're not seeing my disability if that makes sense I don't even know if I'm explaining this correctly um, but it, it just I feel like we have to work that much harder um, so I guess you know, my best advice for the disabled community is just really we should try to be be as natural as we can and try to lose those anxieties, um, though I know it's easier said than done. But, you know, at the end of the day, I don't want to work for an agency that's not going to support me or that's not going to provide an inclusive environment for all, um, nor is going to provide um, an inclusive environment just because I'm there. So when I you know, if I'm working for an agency and they just start making all the changes because I'm there, you know, that can be pretty frustrating. So I I beat around that question and I apologize. But I guess 
you know, my best advice is just really being a great advocate for yourself and, you know, showing them what you got. Meredith, uh, we just got a comment that said you're explaining this very clearly, and I completely agree. Thank you for articulating that so beautifully. Uh, Julie, let's go to you with the same question. What advice would you have for a person with disabilities who's trying to find a job? So I would say if you are disabled and you're working somewhere where you're happy, tell your friends, tell your community. If you're looking for a job and disabled, ask your community. Because what we have found is that the power of referral is really driving as much access as just what's happening inside of an organization. And so you you see that talent travels in teams, travels in packs. We've seen it across a variety of different um, um, areas of diversity within our workforce. And, um, and it's kind of a powerful door opener in that we can leverage relationships inside the organization to get ready and relationships outside the organization to get ready. So I think about the different um, employment agencies and relationships that we leverage um, as an employer, like um, Minnesota Voc Rehab, for example, right? We allow their job coaches to come into our plants and see everything that we do to understand specifically where there might be barriers where we can make an adjustments and also to give a realistic job preview to the the individuals that they're working with so that everybody can be successful um, and those are the kinds of partnerships that i think help to prepare someone um, to make a good employment decision um, and then for us to be fully prepared to set somebody else up for success that is coming into our organization Thank you, Julie. Before we go to Eric, I just want to call everyone's attention to the chat. There's lots of rich content being shared and resources, so feel free to, to browse the chat section. And also, we will have time for questions from you all at the end of this, so feel free to submit questions in the chat, and I'll be making sure that we capture those for later on. All right, Eric, what advice do you have for a person with disabilities trying to get a job? Yeah, I um, won't Failures don't define you or, the, you know, when you're when you get turned out for a job, you can't let that define your movement toward your great job. Um, and so I think a lot of times we are constantly built in society to get feedback from others and and others are constantly judging whether we're right, whether we're wrong, whether we're good enough. And I think if an individual with disabilities is using those external factors to judge if they're good enough. I think it can be a tough road to hold. Um, and I think it's having those positive encouragements through those that are in their circles, those that advocate for them to continue to lift them up with the understanding in time it will happen. And that job probably wasn't the best job. It probably sucks anyway. You didn't you didn't want to be there, right? Lift them up, um, encourage them that there are so many opportunities out there and you'll find the best one for you that'll give you what you need. Um, such that their own internal doubt and pressure doesn't take it away from them because then they may begin to minimize their goals, minimize what they want to get from an employee in a job. And they begin to take jobs that will hire them versus jobs that will really reflect um, the best of their ability. So for me, it's to constantly, when I, when I, when I rock with people is to lift them up and say, hey, man, brother, that's going to happen, right? You know, what you want in life is going to happen. And I think that encouragement continues to keep them to have the proper momentum uh, through the challenges that we all can face when we're looking for a job, but but we know it's tougher. Um, so I think it's that constant push and encouragement by everybody that's in their circle uh, about what can be the possibility and what will be the possibility so they don't change or diminish their own goals. Go ahead, Julie. Just one thing I would add, beautifully said, Eric, I think also like that self-belief and erasing that self-doubt, like obviously either, you know, easier said than done, but like in that self-advocacy to ask for someone to be a sponsor or a mentor, like someone that can give you, give you feedback, can open doors, can be a point person, 
um, to at least keep an ear to the ground where there could be opportunities, even in coaching on on conversations, how to present yourself. Like, I, I think there are more people in this world that are ready to help and extend themselves to individuals. Um, but part of it is is just taking that first step and and asking for someone to be an advocate for you, to be a sponsor, um, and uh, and and help someone move along the path to securing that next great opportunity for themselves. Thanks, Eric and Julie. Uh, question back to you, Eric and Julie. We'll start with you, Eric. We've talked a lot about hiring. We've talked a lot about how we get people in the door. Once they are in the door, let's talk about retention, promotion. Um, what are some best practices and strategies that you've learned uh, through your job at retaining and promoting a diverse workforce? Uh, there, there's a couple I'll, I'll mention. One is there's constant turnover in an organization throughout the organization. And I don't think typically employers evaluate whether the job requirements have changed. Go back 20 years ago, maybe they don't change as much. I think with the introduction of technology, the, what's required of a job is constantly in flux as it fits into organization or what actually has to happen. And so I believe that we've found opportunities to move people because technology has changed the nature of what we needed from that job or room. Um, and having a system in place that causes you to pause for rehires or open positions that are not new positions, you typically do this for new positions, I think is can benefit an organization to figure out, has that skill set or the requirements of that skill set changed? And if so, how does that open us up for an organization to move somebody into a, a, a role that might stretch them or allow them to use uh, greater capacity um, in that? And when people see that and they see their peers really growing within an organization, I think it really drives more of that uh, momentum to really drive. So I think constant reevaluation of roles. And then once again, looking at things from what people can bring to roles versus what roles can bring. You know, the notion I always use is like when we think about a leader, we, you know, go down the aisle of, I'll continue to say it, Borders or Barnes and Noble, one of them still exists. Um, and you go to the leadership section, there's plenty of books that would tell you what a leader has to be. They have to be polished. They have to be, you know, able to do, you know, particularly, you know, leadership presence. They, they define this concept or construct. And the more we let others define the construct of what success will come from, the more we're going to isolate people from having those opportunities. But if you look at what the individuals can uniquely bring to roles, I think you'll find that shifting people into roles and jobs and really create something new that the organization wasn't able to unlock in the past. Thank you, Eric. Same question to you, Julie. Uh, what are some strategies and best practices for retaining and promoting a diverse workforce? So I would say, number one, asking for feedback. Have the courage to ask for feedback. What is working? What is still a barrier for you? What is challenging? And hand in hand is having a team that's in the field. Like I am very fortunate to have teams that are in our plants that are energized by working very closely with members of our workforce. We have to have continuous improvement mindsets that will allow us to be checking in with people and understanding like what's working, what's not working. And as a result, that opens up all sorts of space for Eric, you had mentioned a couple things around technology and where we have now virtual remote interpreter iPads for our deaf employees and checking in. Is your login working? Are you charging the iPad? Like all of these very tactical things that make or break whether someone has access to the experience or not. Um, strategic relationships have been another piece of the best practice sharing um, that we've learned here at Anderson. And whether that's in-person interpreters that we have in our frontline leadership development programs, allowing full access to an experience that goes on for many, many weeks for someone to come to understand what it means to be a leader at Anderson. And not only is that an opportunity in this case for um, deaf individuals in our organization now being ready and placed in leadership roles, but I think also for members of the existing workforce and leaders to see the mechanics 
behind how we make an experience accessible and to understand that that now is on its way to becoming a standard in the organization. We're not there yet. Um, but again, just for us to open the door and get the feedback again with community to understand what are the solutions. They're not all expensive. They're all, you know, small changes in a lot of cases to process that drives heightened accessibility. And you as a, an employer need to lean into those opportunities to listen. Thanks, Julie. Meredith, I'm wondering if you have anything to add to this topic of how do can we best retain employees with disabilities? Uh, um, so I think the first and foremost is making it feel like an inclusive um, environment. You know, I do some trainings and I've done one recently on integration versus in inclusivity. You know, as a society, we've come a long way in disability history where we aren't segregated anymore. We are integrated. People with disabilities are integrated into the community. But not all places where we're integrated are we included. And it's it's a very it's the in, inclus, inclusivity and segre, or and integration are two very different things. Um, and I think you know, players need to think about that. I think players need to, um, you know, review their best practices every year to make sure that they are, you know, inclusive and, you know, that are, they're hearing everybody's voices, not just the disability community, but, you know, every, everybody's voices. Um, like I said earlier, I think it's crucial that people with disabilities are at the table. So if you're going to talk about how to be an inclusive workforce, um, especially for people with disabilities, then you need to have people with disabilities at the table. If you're going to talk about us, then we need to be at the table. Um, and then I love the idea of, you know, surveying what's working, what's not working, you know, and what's not working, how can we work together to, you know, make sure it works. Um, so I think it really, you know, for an employer or an HR standpoint, I think the mindset um, of that it's going to always be changing um, needs to be accepted, that it's not a one and done and we're we're inclusive. Nope, it's inclusivity, you know, changes all the time, um, depending on what's going on, you know, in, in society and in the workforce. Um, and then I think the last thing is, you know, be be the agency that people talk about in a good way, obviously. Uh, but be be the agency that people are like, yeah, dang, they are inclusive. They, you know, they don't look at barriers or anything like that. They invite everybody or they employ everybody. Um, so strive as an agency to be that employer, I think is really important. Thank you, Meredith. Very well said. Yeah. Um, we have a question from the audience for Julie. Uh, Julie, you commented on the huge cost for the upgrade, I believe, when you were talking about that audio system. The question is how many companies can realistically afford that? But let me rephrase that because we don't want you to speculate on behalf of all the other companies out there. But maybe what what is it about Anderson's culture that allowed this investment to happen? Well, first of all, like our number one priority is the safety of our employees. Like it's a non-negotiable for us. And when this system was directly linked to the safety of our employees, um, given the size of this facility especially, um, it need to be addressed. And it was old and antiquated and, um, and for many, many reasons needed to be upgraded. And it, it's a big plant. So it caused it, it was cause for a big investment. Um, and it's been a transformational change in terms of people understanding what's happening in the facility. Um, and yes, not, not every company could make that, um, that investment, but I think when you're running like this one plant in particular in Bayport, Minnesota, our, our largest plant, and you've got so many individuals working around the clock, third shift into first shift into second shift across many sub plants under one roof, like that's. That's our responsibility as an employer to keep everybody safe, and uh, an accessible public address system was was part of the the solution. So um, I'm just happy that through many of the conversations that we had with our employees, 
both voice of the employee surveying, as well as when we started having a growing number of deaf individuals in our Bayport plant. Um, part of our our response was to work with the Minnesota Employment Center. We had an individual by the name of Austin Beatty who um, came on site and conducted feedback sessions with almost all of our deaf employees to understand what are the barriers and prioritize those. And some of them were such simple asks. It was almost embarrassing that they had been navigating the employee space with something that was so small as um, one request was, I, I work in a subplant where I there aren't any windows. I can't see really what time of day it is, and I can't have my phone on me for safety reasons on our shop floor. Um, do you think you could just sync the clocks so that the clocks are accurate? Yes, we we can update the clocks, right? So I think just asking the question, what might help you? And in this case, because um, I'm hearing and I don't sign leveraging a community partner like the Minnesota Employment Center to build a bridge for us to gain understanding, prioritize what people need, and then share that out then in um, kind of a, a cultural competency session with the leaders um, to understand that um, there's a barrier and how can we solution around that and help people to have access. It's important to me that we end our webinar today with uh, a future facing sentiment that is more optimistic. So this last question is in that vein. Uh, let's start with Eric. And the question is, looking ahead, what makes you most excited and hopeful about the future of inclusivity and accessibility in the workforce? Well, first off, I'm going to give me a t-shirt of uh, Mr. Steve Renardi, nothing about us without us. <laughs> so I'm gonna go get that printed and I might be selling those on the streets of New York here. Um, that That is awesome. Um, I think that, now back to your question, that that's about another social enterprise. I think technology is a key. Um, and there are, that to me is just game changing. One of the things that we were here in New York doing is visiting a tech conference, which was really about some of the things that are really going to be folding into the workforce development phase, uh, place. Uh, some of it can't talk about it. They, they swore us a secrecy, but the things that are happening in augmented reality, where you can utilize some of these tech tools to really instruct and provide guidance and really direct feedback. And especially if you, with the integration of AI is going to change kind of the game for especially one of our population individuals with intellectual disabilities that, you know, given some rep repetition with doing certain things, um, they can get it, but that having that uh, coach really be readily there and available, I think is great. And then the cost of these types of things are dropping. Um, and, there, and, and so technology is getting greater, but the cost of it and the tools are going down. And so I am excited when I think about what that means for us, when I go out between now and 2030 and think about the the utilization of uh, technology in the course of our businesses to create, a, I think, a drastic number of new opportunities that may not have been there before. Um, that's That, I think, is going to be the game changer. Thank you, Eric. Julie, let's go to you next. Looking yeah. for Looking forward, what makes you most excited and hopeful about the future of inclusivity and accessibility in the workforce? Thanks, Chris. I, I would have to piggyback on what Eric said around technology, right? Just what we're seeing in terms of automation and removing a lot of the physicality of jobs that we see in our manufacturing plants has been transformational as we upgrade existing subplants or build new subplants in new parts of the country. We stood up our plant in Goodyear, Arizona, and now another one in Locust Grove, Georgia. Huge opportunities to take um, just some processes and automate them to take some of the wear and tear of and the requirements of, of performing the job um, to, to transform those things, as well as looking at where we can um, inject technology into part of the employee experience to provide better access. And some of those things include exploring apps that can be part of training or shop floor communication that include read it to me functionality. We have a lot of speakers of other languages and that's a, another barrier to full access to the employee experience that we 
We put significant effort into trying to overcome. Um, and again, it's just all part of being open to trialing new technologies, new processes, pulling in critical strategic relationships. Um, again, just understanding the what there is to unleash and the human potential um, as as people find their way in the world and find a successful path for their for their career. Thank you, Julie. Meredith, let's end with you. Looking forward, what makes you most excited and hopeful about the future of inclusivity, inclusivity and accessibility in the workforce? Um, well, I think what makes me very excited is that we're having conversations like this, that we have, you know, 30 some people just in this hour that have, you know, sec or them, given their time to discuss this. And, you know, I have no doubt that everybody in this group is going to at least talk to one person about what they talked about today or what we talked about today. So I think that really gets me going um, in the positive way is that we're having these discussions um, and, you know, that employers um, are saying, what can we do that? They're not saying, well, that sucks. And we're, you know, we're we're good how we are. No, we have a lot of employers that are saying, how can we be inclusive? How can we help? Um, I think that's another huge thing. Um and then the third one, I just really, you know, to piggyback off Julie and Eric, that there the technology out there um, is amazing. And there's a lot of people with disabilities that um, are being that the technology is expanding their world um, and in all aspects of life, not just employment, but within employment, it's ex expanding their opportunities um, to have jobs that they, you know, probably were told before that they couldn't have. Um, but now because of this technology, they're able to have. Um, so it's really open doors um, in that aspect too. Um, and then lastly, I think uh, accommodations in general are really, you know, uh, uh, not a buzzword, but there's the employers are utilizing them more and, you know, not being so, you know, restrictive or saying we can't discuss it. Um, they they are and they're thinking outside the box and, you know, supporting individuals. So I think there's a lot of success in that, though. Are we perfect? Absolutely not. Um, but if we have individuals like everybody in this in this chat or in this group, um, I think, you know, we have a positive future that we can uh, build upon. Here in Minnesota, it was cloudy and dreary when this webinar started and now it is very sunny and beautiful outside. I think that's an analogy for how inspiring this conversation was, uh, not only from our amazing panelists, but by the perspectives and resources and cheerleading and encouragement that I was observing in the chat function today. So thank you all very much for your contributions and for, for sharing your passion about this really important topic. Um, thank you to our panelists, Julie, Meredith, Eric, you are just awesome. Uh, and for all of you who observed today, we hope this conversation will inspire you to have that first conversation or take that next step in advancing inclusive employment in Minnesota. Thank you for being here today and enjoy the rest of your day.